Gaudeamus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. In this brief time between Series 2 and Series 3, we're exploring a few themes in the history of the early Church, teasing out the concerns of the Church Fathers and the circumstances that called forth their great words and deeds. This week, we'll talk about early Christian worship and how acts of Christian worship revolutionized society. St. John Chrysostom was a thundering voice crying out in the church of the late 4th and early 5th centuries. He lived in times of peace and prosperity for Christians. He preached in cities where commerce was pretty good, Antioch in Syria and the capital city of Constantinople. The faith had been legal for two generations by then and had withstood a severe test in the brief reign of the anti-Christian emperor Julian. Having survived that close call, The Christians could rest easy, go about their business, and show up for liturgy on Sunday. The wealthy could, anyway, and they could arrange their days so that they didn't have to see the poor who made their easy lives possible. If they felt a twinge of conscience now and then, they could knock it back with the donation of gold vessels to the cathedral church. John, like his contemporary Basil, found this situation unbearable. How could rich Christians establish communion with the poor at Mass on Sunday and yet neglect them throughout the rest of the week? St. Paul had told the Corinthians that the Eucharist made the rich and poor one body. Why, wondered John, was one part of the body allowing another to suffer and to die? And how could the wealthy present themselves for communion on Sunday when they lived with such a disconnect on Monday through Saturday? So he put the matter to his congregation, and he addressed them in stark terms. Listen, he said, do you wish to honor the body of Christ? Do not ignore him when he is naked. Do not pay homage in the temple clad in silk, only then to neglect him outside where he suffers cold and nakedness. He who said, this is my body, is the same one who said, you saw me hungry and you gave me no food, and whatever you did to the least of my brothers, you did also to me. What good is it if the Eucharistic table is overloaded with golden chalices when he is dying of hunger? Start by satisfying his hunger, and then with what is left you may adorn the altar as well. Chrysostom saw a profound connection between Eucharistic communion and social justice, between liturgy and charity. He preached on this in the 4th century, but by then the connection was very well established. It was as old as the gospel. The fathers of the church had been making the connection since the gospel was new on the scene, and yet it always arrived as something surprising and even shocking. Maybe it still does. Christianity was a relatively new religious movement in North Africa in the year 190. In fact, it was still fairly new on the world scene. It had begun just a few generations before in a remote Roman province called Judea, located at the edge of the Roman Empire and it was just beginning to reach important African cities like Carthage. The Christian religion was so unusual that it baffled people and required an explanation. A prominent lawyer named Tertullian, a convert to Christianity from Roman polytheism, offered such an explanation. He wrote a book called The Apologeticum, which still stands as a model defense of Christian life. He was an early practitioner of what we now call apologetics. He addressed in particular the elements of Christianity that his pagan neighbors found revolutionary, threatening, alarming, or just plain strange and different. What non-Christians found so different about Christianity was not so much its rituals or its books or the architecture of its temples. It was not its clothing or dietary restrictions or monuments or art. It was, rather, its kindness. The most notable feature of Christian life was the charity and unity of Christian believers. This is how Tertullian explained it. We have our treasury, 
but it's not made up of admission fees, as in a religion that may be bought. Once a month, each person puts in a small donation, but only if he wants to, and only if he can. There is no compulsion. Everything is voluntary. These gifts, then, are not taken and spent on parties, drinking bouts, and restaurants, but to support and bury poor people, to supply the wants of orphans and elderly people who are homebound, those who have suffered shipwreck, and those who have been condemned to work in the mines, or banished to the islands, or shut up in prisons. It is such deeds of noble love that lead many to put a brand upon us and say, See how they love one another. Charity, peace, unity, kindness. These are the most striking qualities of Christian life, as seen from the outside. And the church's way of life was so different, so distinctive, that it was like a brand mark on the Christians' bodies. The citizens of Carthage who worshipped the Roman gods knew little or nothing about the church's sacraments and doctrines. Those were private affairs, conducted behind closed doors. The local pagans knew little about Christianity's inner life, but they knew the city's Christians by their way of loving one another, which was evident for all to see. Love is what set Christians apart from their non-Christian neighbors, even as it attracted those same neighbors to Christianity. This was not a quality unique to the African church. It was a quality the African Christians held in common with believers in Rome, Antioch, Alexandria, and Gaul. We find evidence of it everywhere, especially in the works of the other Christian authors known as the early church fathers. Even before Tertullian, St. Justin Martyr gave the same testimony for the church in Rome. In yet another document from that time, the anonymous letter to Diognetus, we find a similar report on the church in Greece and its extraordinary kind of life. It was extraordinary. Because social interaction throughout the world in that period was marked by strife, division, conflict, and power struggles. Governors tried unsuccessfully to unite neighboring peoples and ethnic groups in the common cause of the Roman Empire. They often imposed unity by force, and they sometimes brought peace by crushing the conflicting parties. They brought order and development by means of taxation, which the people resented. Women had no rights in that world. The marriage bond meant little. Adultery was common, and divorce was easy. Abortion and infanticide were common, as were euthanasia and suicide. All these were praised as virtuous acts. In places like Italy, a majority of the residents lived as slaves, subject to the whims of their masters. Society was stratified with rights and privileges reserved mostly for the wealthy. In such a world, kindness and generosity were rare commodities. Yet, as Tertullian emphasized, repeating it more than once, the Christians accomplished peace and mutual support voluntarily and freely. Christians obviously observed some social principle that inspired them to deeds of love for other people. It was the principle of love, of charity. Though the principle is not always easy to keep, it's remarkably easy for a Christian to find. In the New Testament, there is a line that appears more than a dozen times in the writings of many different authors. It is simply this. Love one another. Love one another. At the Last Supper, Jesus introduced this principle as a commandment, repeating it for emphasis. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. A couple chapters later, he said it yet again, and actually twice again, for a total of four times. His apostles had by this time firmly proved themselves to be thick-headed. He was not going to let them miss the cue, so he said it yet again. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This I command you, to love one another. Jesus' first disciples understood this command to be an essential part of the gospel. They even held it to be identical with the gospel. Late in his life, St. John the Apostle wrote of the new commandment as Christ's most original teaching. And now I beg you, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And just in case John's readers missed it, he said it again and again in the same terms. 
For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. The other apostles echoed the same phrase. St. Peter told the Christians to love one another earnestly from the heart. And St. Paul said to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. These first Christians assumed that neighborly love is a truth that should be self-evident to believers, instilled in them by God. St. Paul said, But concerning love of the brethren, you have no need to have anyone write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. It is a simple enough principle, but it's challenging to put it into action. All of Catholic social doctrine is a practical working out of that simple commandment given by Christ to his followers, and given by those followers to their followers. Because Christian love is not mere politeness or courtesy, it's not just getting along with one another. Christ established a different and much higher standard as he issued the command, Even as I have loved you, you also love one another. Wow. We need to love as Jesus loved. And how was that? Christ loved completely and in a self-giving way. He held nothing back. He gave his life for the sake of his friends. And there is no greater love than this, he said. As Christ loved sacrificially and without discrimination, so Christians must love others. And not just their own family or tribe. Another thing that set Christianity apart was its refusal to discriminate between Gentile and Jew, slave and free, woman and man. Christian love was to be universal and indiscriminate. That's the root meaning of the word Catholic. Christian tradition refers to such sacrificial love as charity, from the Latin word caritas and the Greek word charis, which means gift. The love of charity requires the gift of oneself. Jesus' new commandment echoed often in the New Testament and still more in the writings of the early church fathers. It's there in the doctrine, but it's still more in what we glimpse of the life of the church. We've already seen in Tertullian's account the social evidence of Christian love in North Africa in the second century. Orphans and widows found support from the church. The poor received food. Prisoners received comfort. The housebound and lonely knew friendship and companionship. Travelers knew where they could find protection and shelter. Tertullian's list of charitable activities is almost identical to a list produced decades earlier in Rome by St. Justin Martyr. Both men make clear that these habitual Christian acts of love were simply not found elsewhere in the ancient world. That's something we can't easily wrap our minds around today. Before Christianity, the Greco-Roman world knew nothing like institutional charities. Before Christianity, there were no hospitals. Before Christianity, there was no drive for universal education or world peace. Before Christianity, there was no serious discussion of ethics in warfare. There were no trade schools, no programs for the destitute. There was wealth and there was poverty each condition dependent upon the existence of the other. Christian love shone in that darkness like a bright light, a blinding light to those whose darkness was deepest. Many pagans, especially the most powerful, saw Christian love as a threat to the social order. It was revolutionary, and so it must be stamped out. The church's singular charity became a trigger for its persecution. But let's go back for a moment to those lists of Justin Martyr and Tertullian, those lists of charitable activities. What's interesting is that both men bring up Christian charity not to boast. They do it not to exhort anyone to join in their program of social activism. They do it not to buttress their exposition of any Christian doctrine. So why do they do it? What is the immediate occasion for their discussion of Christian charitable activity. Both men list off the programs of Christian charity as part of their explanation of the Holy Mass. For Justin and for Tertullian, for the Christians of Africa and the Christians of Rome, it's the Mass that makes charity. It's the Mass that makes Christians charitable. 
Both men see Christian charity as a product of the grace received in the church's liturgy. Both men discuss Christian charity as an aside to describe what happens to the church's weekly offertory collection. Already in 107 AD, St. Ignatius of Antioch was making the connection for his people. If you practice your faith, if you live the Eucharistic life of the church, you'll see a different society. The Mass makes charity. On the other hand, he said, bad faith leads to uncharity. Here are his words verbatim. He says that the heretics of the first post-apostolic generation, quote, have no regard for love, no care for the widow or the orphan or the oppressed of the bond or of the free, of the hungry or of the thirsty, unquote. And what else, Bishop Ignatius, what else do they do? Ah, he said, they abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they confess not the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins, and which the Father of his goodness raised up again. Those, therefore, who speak against this gift of God incur death in the midst of their disputes. So what does this show us? What do we see in this letter from a disciple of St. Peter? For Ignatius, as for the apostles before him, the Mass was the beginning of charity. It was the source of charity. It was a mingling of our perishable flesh with Jesus' immortal flesh, and so a mingling of divine life with our own. The Mass was what empowered Christians to be Christ to the world, to bring it healing, consolation, friendship, and relief of its suffering. Here's the way the great liturgical scholar Virgil Michael put it in the middle of the 20th century. What the early Christians did at the altar of God in the central act of Christian worship, they also lived out in their daily lives. They understood fully that the common action of their worship was to be the inspiration of all their actions. They knew well that the common giving of themselves to God and to the brethren of Christ, was in fact a solemn promise made to God that they would live their lives in the same love of God and of God's children, their brethren in Christ, throughout all the day. Unless they did that, their action before God's altar would be at best lip service, a lie before God. Virgil Michael is simply observing what is evident in all the pages of the Father's writings. A third-century manual of church discipline directs its readers, widows and orphans are to be revered like the altar. Widows and orphans are to be revered like the altar of sacrifice. Such a command envisions a social life based on a network of charity, but it presumes a deep Eucharistic piety. It presumes an altar that is revered and beloved because it belongs to Jesus. It's a social life based on the inner transformation of persons. Those who received Holy Communion were held accountable to the life of Christ, just as St. Paul had held the Corinthians accountable. The Eucharist was the source and summit of Christian life, but it was a pure gift from God. No one could earn it, and it was no one's right. Thus, even the earliest Christian document, the Didache, paid careful attention to the conditions for a worthy reception of Holy Communion. No one could earn it, and it was no one's right, and those who strayed from the morals of the Catholic Church were barred from communion. Public scandal meant public excommunication and public penance, no matter how prominent the sinner Probably the most dramatic example involved the emperor himself, the Christian emperor Theodosius the Great. In the year 390, Theodosius threw a tantrum that ended in the massacre of 7,000 residents of Thessalonica. Ambrose, the bishop of Milan, which was then the capital of the empire, responded by refusing communion to the emperor. In fact, Ambrose physically blocked Theodosius' path as the emperor tried to enter the church. He then wrote Theodosius a private letter in which he persuaded him that after such a glaring public crime, he needed to make an equally public penance before he could receive absolution and before he could receive communion. 
With another emperor, that letter might have cost Ambrose his life. Theodosius, however, submitted to the judgment of the bishop. In the end, he had to go through a long and very public penance before Ambrose would lift his excommunication. The emperor laid aside all the insignia of power and lamented his sin in the church, where everyone could see. It made a powerful impression on the people. The emperor himself was setting the example of penance. For the rest of his life, not a day went by when Theodosius did not grieve for his error. For his part, Theodosius seems to have understood that Ambrose had shown him real Christian love, real Christian charity, the love that sometimes prescribes bitter medicine to cure a deadly case of sin. Theodosius himself said, I don't know of any bishop worthy of the name except Ambrose. The Holy Mass was serious business for the early Christians. They held themselves accountable to it every day. Every day they knew they were living off their last communion. Every day they knew they were living toward their next communion. Thus, the Mass had everyday application, everyday implications. It went with the Christian to work, to the market. The Mass had profound social implications. This is what the Fathers knew. The kingdom of Christ has arrived because Jesus reigns now in the Church in the Blessed Sacrament of the Altar. That's the teaching of Basil and Chrysostom, Augustine and Ambrose. And yet Chrysostom urged his 4th century congregations to hasten the day when that reality was no longer invisible, but abundantly evident everywhere, in the city streets and beside rural roadways. The Eucharist empowers Christians in every age to build up new cultures on the ruins of the old ones. As the old Roman Empire crumbled, there arose a new world order with new institutions. Hospitals and universities, soup kitchens and homeless shelters, hospices and hostels. A culture of death crumbled, and in its place Christians were able to begin a civilization of love. The Mass does not force us to do this, but if we know what we're about, we'll feel compelled to take Christ's love into the streets. It's one of the great paradoxes of Christian life that we cannot keep faith, cannot keep hope, cannot keep charity unless we give them away, unless we evangelize, unless we love sacrificially. St. Augustine said it most succinctly, those who see charity have seen the Trinity. Through the Eucharist, God changes ordinary people into himself, as surely as he changed the elements of bread and wine. He forms us as living stones in the temple of his church. He builds up a Eucharistic culture to replace the culture of death. Now, before you go away, I want to say one more thing. Please consider making a donation to help us produce these podcasts. Right now, we're waging the campaign that makes or breaks us for continuing our mission next year. What's more, we've received a matching pledge— a group of generous donors has promised to match all gifts up to $111,000 that are made between now and December 8th. Our sponsor, CatholicCulture.org, is run by Trinity Communications, a nonprofit organization, so donations are tax deductible in the United States. Donations can be made by credit card, PayPal, check, or in the form of stock. So please, Go now to our donation form at catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. And remember, your gift will be matched. We're grateful for anything you can give. And we pray for our benefactors every day. I thank you for listening. Dequarum solemnitate Gaudentange Collaudant filium dei. Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics, including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman.
You might also enjoy Criteria, the Catholic film podcast devoted to works of high artistic caliber and Catholic interest. And for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, listen to the Catholic Culture Podcast.